Hey everyone, how is it going? Uh, fine? Hi, do you remember me? I was on, I was in your class, I saw a picture of that, yeah, that was pretty crazy. Hey guys. It's so quiet now. That's amazing. I didn't know you guys could get that quiet. Except for all the shush. If people are already quiet, you can stop shushing because they've, they've successfully shushed. Hey, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter. Nice Hi. to meet you. Hi. Sorry, we don't have enough time for you guys to introduce yourselves. So it's just going to be a one-way introduction. Hi. Hi. That works. That works. I don't know about you guys, but next week, I'm going to have Thanksgiving next week. Who's having Thanksgiving dinner next week? <laughs> guys. It is by far, it is by far my favorite holiday. I, I make so much stuffing, like I fill up the counter with stuffing, and I pretty much eat it all. But I know that it's not going to look anything like this, right? This is like the famous Norman Rockwell painting. Like my Thanksgiving, it's going to be a lot messier for sure. I don't think my mom's going to wear that shirt. I don't, does anyone mom wear that shirt anymore? Not even close. And I think, I think that celery, in this painting? Has anyone ever had a side of celery at Thanksgiving? You seriously have. Like, like your mom said, here you go, here's your celery. And it didn't come with buffalo wings, it was just by itself, just celery. Oh gosh, who does that? I don't know what's going on here. These are acorns or grapes or something. Anyway, anyway, when you're eating your Thanksgiving dinner next week, I want you to think about where that stuff came from. The grocery store, okay. The farm, no, no, we have to take a step back. Where the stuff you're about to eat, I want you to think about what it's made of. And I want you to think, what are you made of? What are you made of? Atoms. What else? What are you made, like literally, what are you? Okay, raise your hand if you, if you want to take a guess. What are you made of? Matter, what is your matter made of? What kind of matter? Right here, red shirt. Water, what is water made of? Hydrogen and oxygen. What else, what are you made of? You're made of iron, wow. I, uh, iron Man, right here, guys. What are you made of? Leftovers from the Big Bang, what are you made of? Molecules, what are, what are some elements that are in you? Uh, you eat bananas for the, for the potassium. We've got water, which is hydrogen and oxygen. You take a deep breath of air. What's in that air? Oxygen, what else? Nitrogen. Uh, you drink milk for its uh, calcium, right? You've got some silverware on that table. Stainless steel, what's in, what's in stainless steel? Iron, steel is made of iron. It's coated in something to make it stainless. Do you know what it is? Chromium. Dip in chromium and it makes it stainless steel. We're, so, we're, we're made of elements, right? There's so many elements. There's, there's like a whole table of elements. Thanksgiving pun right there. Thanks, the, the table of elements. Look at all those elements. Fundamental stuff that we're made of. Everything you're made of, everything that turkey is made of, everything the table, everything the chair, the rock under your feet is all made of combinations of these elements. And you're allowed to ask, where do these elements come from? Why are these elements here? Why are there certain abundances of elements? Why are some elements more common than others? Well, the answer is, these elements that you're made of, that the turkey's made of, that the table's made of, they come from space. That's because everything comes from space, right? There was a long time ago, and that's the reason there's an astrophysicist here standing in front of you to talk about it. It's space. Because a long time ago, five billion years ago, there wasn't an Earth. The Earth hadn't formed yet. The Sun hadn't formed yet. They came from space. And this story of how the Earth formed, how our own solar system formed, is actually pretty straightforward. You start off with a big cloud of gas. A big cloud of gas and dust 
that's just hanging around the galaxy, minding its own business, not bothering anyone. And this cloud of gas and dust can persist, can linger for thousands, millions of years without changing. But if that cloud of gas and dust is perturbed or irritated, let's say a supernova goes off nearby, or that cloud of gas and dust passes by another one, gets agitated, Something interesting happens to that cloud of gas and dust. Here's a simulation I'm going to show you. Now, even though this thing is round and yellow, it is not the sun. All right? I was not in charge of the colors of this simulation that I'm going to show you. It just happens to look like the sun, but it's not. Just, just roll with it. We've got a cloud of gas and dust, stuff, hanging out in the galaxy, hundreds of light years across. And it can persist in this state for a long time until it is perturbed. And when it's perturbed, very quickly that cloud of gas and dust begins to change. Pieces of the gas will undergo rapid gravitational collapse. They'll pinch off and they'll collapse. And regions of this gas and dust will form pockets where stars can form, where the energies and the temperatures and the pressures are so high that stars can form. Those are those little white dots. Those are stars being born inside of this gigantic cloud of gas and dust. And the leftovers around these stars, the stuff that doesn't reach the star, ends up becoming a solar system. These are the seeds of planets. You might have little bits of rock around a young star. And the rock will find each other. It'll stick together. They'll glue together. They'll have a little bit more gravity, so they'll pull a little bit more. They'll be a little bit heavier. They'll gather some friends and neighbors. They'll smash into each other. It's a very violent, rapid process. And at the end of it, out of this blob of gas and dust, you formed a star. You formed planets, rocky planets, gas giant planets. You formed asteroids, comets, all the rest. And what goes on in this solar system, what the solar system is made of, must come from that cloud of gas and dust billions of years ago, right? There's no other way of getting stuff to the solar system. It had to start out that way. So if there's silicon or magnesium or potassium or nitrogen or whatever in a solar system, or if there's hydrogen and oxygen to make water in the solar system, that hydrogen and oxygen and everything else had to come from the big cloud of gas and dust. It had to come from space billions of years ago. Okay, I haven't really answered the question yet of where these elements come from. Yeah, they come from space, but how did they get in space? If our solar system was formed from this giant cloud of gas and dust, how did the giant cloud of gas and dust get there? The answer is nuclear power. Oh, not that kind of nuclear power, this kind of nuclear power. This is the sun. This is what would happen if you were to look at the sun. Don't look at the sun, please. All right, you will, you'll burn your eyes out. You really will. Let robots and let spacecraft look at the sun instead and then send you some pretty pictures. So normally we think of the sun as just kind of there, like a hot glowing thing in the sky. But when you look at it carefully, you see how the sun is a roiling, boiling mass of plasma. It's active. It's almost alive. And what's powering the sun, what's powering all these prominences, what's, prom what's powering all these bubbles of plasma, the surface of the sun is literally boiling, just like you have a boiling pot of water. The surface of the sun is boiling with plasma, but instead of little bubbles coming up, it's giant blobs of plasma that are bigger than the entire earth. And how do you make something like the sun boil? How do you make a ball of plasma that big boil? You need energy for that. And that energy comes from nuclear fusion deep in the core of the sun. The crushing gravity of the entire sun 
pushing down at its core. Imagine going underwater. Have you ever dove underwater and, and your ears start to hurt? And you go deeper and they hurt more? That's from the water pressure pressing in on your eardrums. Imagine going to the bottom of the ocean and feeling that crushing weight of miles of water above you, pressing down on you, compressing you, squeezing you like an empty soda can. It's like that times literally a million or a billion in the core of the sun. The crushing weight of the material of the sun is pressing down on the core. And when that happens, there's so much gravity, there's so much pressure, that you can take two hydrogen atoms, the most primordial element, just a single proton in a hydrogen atom, they get squeezed so close together that they fuse. They become a new element. They become helium. And in that fusion process, there's a little bit of energy left over, just a tiny little bit. But this happens so often, and there's so much hydrogen being fused all the time that that little bit of leftover energy from the fusion process powers the sun. It's been powering it for over 4 billion years. These nuclear reactions have been happening, and they'll continue to happen for another 4 billion years before the sun runs out of hydrogen. That's the source of the heat and the light and the energy in our solar system. And all the energy on Earth that we receive from the sun is from those nuclear reactions. And a byproduct of those nuclear reactions is the creation of new elements, raw fusion taking primordial hydrogen and turning it into helium. Later on in the sun's life, it will turn that helium into nitrogen, into carbon, into oxygen. Elements that you're familiar with, elements that are very common in our universe because they're created, they're formed in the heart of every single star in every single galaxy across the universe. Now, our sun is only so big. It's pretty big, but it's only so big. And it's only going to be able to make up to nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. It won't be able to get higher up in the periodic table. You need a little bit more energy for that. If you want to make heavier elements, you need more gravity, you need more pressure to fuse those elements together to work your way up the periodic table. Thankfully, our sun is not the biggest star in our galaxy or in the universe. There's a lot bigger ones. Here's our sun right there, that tiny little dot right there. You can go up to Sirius or Pollux or Arcturus or Rigel or Diberon. They're you know, hundreds of times bigger than, their, than our own sun. You can go up to Betelgeuse or Antares, thousands of times more massive than our sun where if you were to drop down one of these stars in our own solar system, it would stretch out past the orbit of Jupiter. It would totally consume all of the inner planets. That's how big these stars are. And they're so big that pressure, the gravitational pressure of the squeezing of the star in its core allows these stars to make even more elements. They can go past carbon. They can go past nitrogen. They can go past oxygen. They can start to make more elements. And towards the end of a life of one of these giant stars, they're making all sorts of junk. They're making helium, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, iron, nickel. All of this is happening inside the hearts of the very largest stars in our galaxy. But even the biggest stars don't have enough oomph to go past nickel and iron. They make those two elements, they fuse those elements in the core, and that's as far as they can go. That's because if you want to fuse more, if you want to make your way further up the periodic table, if you want to reach some chromium or some potassium or anything like that, you actually lose energy from the fusion process. You don't gain energy anymore. And so this fusion train that powers stars for billions of years just gives up when it reaches iron and nickel in the core. If you want to make those elements, if you want to fill out the periodic table and make everything that you're familiar with here on Earth, you need the biggest explosions there are. 
you need supernova. Supernova are when these giant stars die. Supernova are the most powerful explosions in the universe. They are so powerful, we can literally see them from across the universe. We can see supernova happening in other galaxies, hundreds of billions of light years away. Across the, the known universe. They are so bright. When these giant stars die, the explosions are so bright that that one supernova will outshine an entire galaxy for a few weeks, and then it fades away. But for those few weeks, that one supernova is brighter than every star in the sky. Every once in a while, supernova go off in our own galaxy. Every once in a while, about three per century. When they occur, when they occur, they are visible during the day. Usually you don't see stars during the day, right? You see the sun, which is technically a star. So you see one star during the day. Sometimes you see the moon, but that's it. Because the sun is so bright, it outshines the light from all the other stars. But when supernova go off in our own galaxy, you can see them during the day. The last one that did this was 500 years ago, roughly. Another one is due any day now. Even in our lifetimes, we might see the death of one of these giant stars. When these explosions occur, when these explosions occur, they are so powerful for a brief moment, just a few weeks, they're so powerful that they confuse almost any other element. They can create the rest of the periodic table. They can fill it out. So if we look again at our periodic table, all you need to do in the cores of stars like our sun, small stars, they will turn into helium, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon. In the cores of massive stars, they will turn it into magnesium, silicon, iron, nickel. And in supernova, you get the rest of the periodic table of the elements. So this is where the elements are created. They are created inside of stars, in nuclear furnaces, and they are created in supernova explosions. And this is how we get the primordial gas cloud that formed our own solar system. They're the leftovers of dead stars. They're the remnants of supernova and past stars that have fused elements in their core, exploded, died, spewed their guts all over the, the galaxy. And then we have new clouds of gas that can pinch off and create new systems. New systems that are enriched with heavier elements. Maybe the first generation of stars was just hydrogen, so there couldn't be any planets. But after a few generations, you build up enough silicon. You may build up enough elements to make rocks. You build up enough rocks that you can make planets. You build up enough water that there can be liquid water on the surface of those planets with an oxygen and nitrogen atmosphere. Maybe there's enough carbon left over that there can be little animals running around on that surface. This story, this insight, was what William Fowler did. Now this picture, so most, the most common picture you see of William Fowler on the internet, he has, he has a nice beard, and I'm a fan of beards. Uh, but I talked to people who used to work with him, who were his students, who were his colleagues. Turns out most of the time he didn't have a beard. Uh, it was only like a couple years where he wore a beard that happened to be the year that he won the Nobel Prize. Usually he ran around like this with his chipmunk cheeks all poking out and everything all happy. So this is, Typical William Fowler. This story is why he got the Nobel Prize. For figuring this out. For telling this story for the first time. And not just having an idea. You don't get a Nobel Prize for just having an idea. You have to work pretty hard to get a Nobel Prize. You have to show everyone else why your idea is right. You have to convince everyone else. You have to lay the groundwork for a new view, a new way of understanding the universe. You don't get a Nobel Prize just for, for laying one brick. Uh, you have to build a whole house to go to the Nobel Prize. And that's what William Fowler did. And one of the coolest things is William Fowler, when he was a student, a grade school student or high school student here in Lima, he was just... He was just one of you. 
He was just a guy, right? a person, a student. You wouldn't be able, you wouldn't be able to pick him out, right? You wouldn't be able to say, aha, that guy is the one that's going to win the Nobel Prize in physics. He was just another student in another town. He didn't even go into college in physics. He started in ceramics. And not like ceramics, like making people's faces, but ceramics like industrial ceramics. And he ended up learning about physics, having a cool physics teacher, liking physics, going into the field, and he ended up winning the Nobel Prize for doing something really fundamental, learning something fundamental about the way our universe works. He did it through hard work. He did it through following his interests and his passions, whatever they were. That led him to physics, and that led him to the prize. There's also a lot of math involved, all right? But, you know, that's, you get trained to do the math. The math comes later. Don't worry about that part. So William Fowler, like I said, he didn't just get the prize for figuring this out. He showed us what the evidence ought to be. He showed us how we know this story is correct. And there's a bunch of pieces of evidence. One is the fact that stars live so long. Nuclear burning in the core is the only way we know of for stars to live for billions of years, which we know they do. And all the elements on the periodic table, they leave a little fingerprint in the light coming from a star. Very subtle, but it's there. And we can look at the light from a star and look for those elements. In fact, that's how helium was discovered. Helium comes from the Greek word helios, which is the word for sun. We learned about the existence of helium by looking at the sun before we found it here on Earth. And we can look at more massive stars and recognize that there's heavier elements in those stars. We can look at the, the dead products from supernova that have spewed all across uh, their local region, and we can identify, oh, hey, there's some silicon, there's some magnesium, there's some potassium, there's some chromium right there. We also notice that the amount of stuff in the universe isn't the same. Not all elements are equally represented in our universe. There's this weird kind of seesaw pattern between even and unnumbered nuclei in the periodic table. The only way to explain that is if they are coming from stars. If stars are burning and creating these elements inside of them. So now, what William Fowler gave us and his collaborators, he wasn't alone, their work set the stage for what we understand to be the life cycle of a star. These life cycles last hundreds of millions or even billions of years. They're formed from clouds of gas. They pinch off, stars form. Nuclear fusion happens in their core. They create new elements. The stars die. They explode, they spew all over the place. They seed the next generation of stars with heavier elements. And the cycle continues on and on and on over eons, over cosmic time. And you and me in your Thanksgiving turkey are a part of this story. You and me are literally, I emphasize literally, I'm not speaking figuratively. I'm not speaking symbolically. Literally, you are made of the ashes of dead stars. The elements in you were formed billions of years ago, and they were shaped into a planet and an ocean and people. You take a breath of air. That nitrogen and oxygen was created in the core of a long dead star billions of years ago. You eat a banana for some potassium. That potassium was created in a supernova explosion billions of years ago. Your bones, the calcium in your bones is older than the earth itself. It was formed in a massive star billions of years ago and it seeded our own solar system. So the next time you look up at, at the sky, at the night sky and you see those stars, they're not just points of light. 
Those stars are your, are your brothers and your sisters. You know, molecularly, atomically, you are connected to those stars. You are a part of their life cycle. You are a part of that process. Now, before I go, I should mention that uh, Willie Fallow really liked trains. And supposedly, like he really, like he grew up in Lima, a railroad town. He saw the trains all the time. He loved them. For his 60th birthday, his colleagues got him a model train. And not just like a little model train that, that could go on this stage. Like a model train that was big enough for him to ride in. And I worked so hard to find a picture of this, but I couldn't. I, there are no pictures of Willie riding his train. Uh, so this will have to do. Just to know that Nobel Prize winning physicists, they have hobbies too, they have interests too, and his particular one was trains. And he also figured out that, that we're stardust. So that's it for my talk, my script. I know we have plenty of time. I did that on purpose so that we can do my favorite thing, which is to answer people's questions. Whatever questions you have about space. Like if you need relationship advice, like I, I can give it. I'm just not very good at that. I'm better about the space questions. So do you guys have any questions at all? We've got a microphone running around. Oh, front row right here. All right, all right, quiet down, guys. Shh, shush, shush, you, shush. How old is a pulsar? How often is a pulsar? Okay, so a pulsar, this is part of the life cycle of a star. When very massive stars die and they go off in that supernova explosion and they light up a galaxy, they leave behind a core. Sometimes that core is a black hole if it's big enough. Sometimes it's a neutron star. A neutron star is, is an atomic nucleus the size of a city. Neutron stars are very strange, very weird objects, incredibly dense. Uh, the common analogy is that they're so dense, so much stuff is crammed into a neutron star that you could take a little thimbleful, just a little teaspoon, and if you brought it back to Earth, that teaspoonful would weigh more than the Great Pyramids because so much stuff is crammed into so little volume. And neutron stars are kind of weird, like I said. They spin rapidly. And by rapidly, I mean a few thousand times per minute. Like a kitchen blender, right? You think that's fast to, to, like, to make a fruit smoothie in the morning or something? OK, imagine something the size of a city doing that. And when they rotate, there are beams of light, like almost like a lighthouse, coming out of the poles of the star. And they'll sweep around, voom, 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 a few times per second, a few hundred times per second sometimes even. We call these things pulsars. When they were first discovered 60 years ago, 50, 60 years ago, we thought they were signals from alien life because it was so regular. It was more accurate, more regular than any clocks we had at the time. Beep, 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 beep. Surely that's like the sign of intelligent life. You can make something that regular. Nope, turns out it's these crazy neutron stars called pulsars because they, they pulse, hence the name pulsar. And they are a part, they're a remnant of dead stars. So the stars die, they explode. They leave behind a big cloud of gas and dust seeded with new elements, and they also leave behind a dead core. In this case, a pulsar. Another question back there. Okay, when it is. So I like, I, I like your enthusiasm with moving your hands. Uh, that's why I use the lapel microphone. Could you repeat the question, keeping the microphone glued to your mouth? Okay. Um, when a supernova explodes, right? Like, it's like super bright. Yes. Like, our eyes or anything like that, we have to stare at it. 
Yes, I do not recommend going near any supernova explosions. Not only will you be blinded, uh, but you will melt. You will be ripped to shreds. There is an entire star's worth of stuff flying out at near the speed of light. So there's not only the intense radiation, which would blind you, and actually the radiation itself would, would burn you up, because there's a lot of it, but the shockwave of material itself. And we see this. We have pictures of this happening, of supernova shockwaves passing through a local region. And you do not want to be in that path. In fact, if supernova were to go off nearby, they would simply irradiate all life on Earth. We've checked. Don't worry. There are no supernova, potential supernova nearby that would be a, th a threat to us. So you can sleep tonight. But it's not a nice place to be. Uh, over there, and then we'll go to the back. Some pictures? No, the only pictures I have are the ones, I should do this, I should start adding just random space pictures at the end of my talks. Uh, but what you can do is you can Google search right now on your phones, you can stop listening to me, uh, and you can go on your phones, you can look up supernova remnant, or you can look up uh, crab nebula. Crab nebula, you don't even need pictures, some of these you can see with your own telescopes. Oh, you, you took me seriously, you're actually on your phones. That was supposed to be a joke. Uh, all right, do it later, do it later. Well, let's, let's all do it later. Uh, white shirt, and I know someone's in the back uh, hankering for a question. So we're gonna do white shirt and then we'll go to the back. All right, we're going all the way back to the Big Bang. So the Big Bang, uh, you notice I started my story with hydrogen. Hydrogen was formed in the very earliest moments of the universe, just a second into the life of the universe. Earlier than that, we really don't understand the character of the universe. Our observations, our physics knowledge, our mathematics can carry us pretty far. It can carry us into the hearts of stars. It can carry us to the edge of the universe. It can carry us to some of its earliest moments, less than a second into the age of the universe. We can understand any earlier that than that, and we simply don't understand. Someday we might, but for now, the only thing I know is that we don't know. In the back. I don't know. Okay. Um, you know, violet stars, right? Supposedly, by stars in the known universe. So you're going to have to repeat that name again? Violet stars? Violet stars? Like purple ones? They're really, really, really hot. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. If our sun is not going to be You know what? Yeah, good question. You know, these things are pretty powerful, right? Supernova, even the most massive supernova we see, are incredibly powerful. They can outshine galaxies, but they can't destroy galaxies. You need a lot to destroy a galaxy. There are more massive things out there. There are more powerful explosions out there. Well, I shouldn't say explosions. There's things called uh, active galactic nuclei, or another name for them is quasars. These are like the engines of massive galaxies that uh, being consumed by a supermassive black hole. And those things can rip apart galaxies. Those things are pretty nasty. But supernova aren't quite nasty enough. But surprisingly, supernova aren't the most nasty thing in the universe. Sweatshirt. Um, so what happens when like, two supernovas <laughs> collide? Like, what happen? like Brian Mom, so you know what? You're, you're giggling, but that's actually, um, there have actually been research papers about this. Supernova uh, can tend to trigger other supernova. And massive stars, when they form, like you saw at the beginning when those stars were forming, uh, stars form in clusters. They form in groups. They're like families. 
And if all of the siblings are massive stars, they all tend to go off around the same time. And so sometimes we can get what are called clusters of supernova, where over 100 supernova go off at roughly the same time. And they actually blow huge bubbles. They can disrupt an entire galactic disk for a while. They'll stream material outside the plane of the galaxy and the galaxy and then that material will rain back down millions of years later we call these galactic fountains and those are powered by multiple supernova going off at the same time how come we can't live on like any other planet yeah no great question like like we live here on earth and we pretty much take it for granted uh, the Earth has a nice, a few advantages to life, right? It's got, it's got some rock, so you got, you got a surface to stand on. It has liquid water. As far as we know, all life requires liquid water. Got tons of sunlight, which is nice. The sun itself is pretty quiet, pretty stable, pretty mellow as stars go. You don't want stars being violent and erratic that can tend to wipe out all life. We have a very nice magnetic field. If you'll notice, uh, the other inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, all really weak magnetic fields. Earth has a nice magnetic field. It's like a force field for us, literally a force field. Deflects deadly cosmic rays that would otherwise kill any life on Earth. We have a nice thick atmosphere that's not too thick. Venus has a nice thick atmosphere, but has crushing density, makes lead uh, liquid, metal liquid is pretty nasty on the surface of Venus. It's not too thin like Mars, where you can't even breathe. We have a nice mixed atmosphere. Life appeared on Earth. It's possible that life could appear on other planets, but we don't know exactly how. It seems maybe life needs the right mixture that Earth provides, and that's why we're here and not on some other planet. But there is the potential for life on other planets and the potential for different kinds of life on different planets. We're working on that problem though. That's the, one of the next major frontiers in astronomy and astrophysics. There was someone, someone has the microphone. There you go. Um, do you believe that there's other elements um, in other planets or solar systems? So when it comes to elements, so I believe that there are other elements. You'll notice that periodic table that I flashed up. Uh, Supernova started to run out after a certain number, and after that, it was all human-made. Like, we were able to make some elements briefly in our laboratory. We can't think of any really natural processes that make some of those extreme, super heavy elements because they're very unstable, they don't last long. It seems like we've pretty much filled out the periodic table, and that finding a new element that's stable, uh, that's super heavy, that we haven't discovered yet, I'm not going to say no, because I don't like saying no as a, as a physicist, but probably not. Uh, back there again. And then we'll come to you. Remind me. Is it possible to have an alien invasion? No. I know I just said I don't like saying no as a physicist, but no. Here's the thing. There's almost certainly life on other planets. There's like a lot of planets out there. There's estimated to be around 100 billion Earth-like planets in our own galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies out there. But to get from one star to another, if you want to invade, that takes a lot of work. Think of how much work we need just to get to the moon, just to send astronauts up into space. You know, we're working on Mars missions, crewed missions to Mars, and it's like, it's, it's huge energy costs. It's a huge engineering effort. To get to the nearest star, that takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of work. And if you're willing to, if you have the capability, if going from one star to another is as easy as walking across this stage, then the Earth has nothing for you. Right? Why would you bother coming down to Earth to get our resources? There's plenty of water everywhere else in the solar system. There's plenty of rock. 
There's plenty of material. There's plenty of solar energy. The earth has nothing for you. Nothing useful for you. Unless you're really curious about people. Like you caught the latest Kardashian escapade that was beamed out into space and you want to go get an autograph or something. Maybe that, that's a possibility. But it just takes so much energy to get from one star to another that if there were aliens and they could travel around the galaxy uh, and colonize any planet they could, they would have done it billions of years ago. Right there. Uh, okay. um. How do I know the universe is infinite? Well, guess what? The universe may not be infinite. We don't know how big the universe is. It's certainly big, like really big. We've, the edge of the universe, the edge of the visible universe, as far as we can see, is about 40 light, billion light years away. The universe is probably a lot larger than what we can see. We're limited by the speed of light, and the universe has only been around for so long. So outside of what we can see, there's probably just more stuff. There's more galaxies, there's more voids, uh, there's more people, whatever. We can't see them and we'll never see them. The true extent of that, we don't know. It could be infinite. It could be infinitely big. It could have a finite size that's just really, really, really big, but we don't know. All we can know is our little observable bubble of that universe, that little piece Up front again? Yeah, if you have the microphone, it's your turn. Um, with the uh, black holes, would it be possible to uh, have one inside the planet as it's crushed down? Is that because it's <laughs> Would it be? Oh, yeah. So uh, in terms of making black holes, you can make anything into a black hole. Really, you just need to squeeze stuff down enough. So if, uh, if you wanted to make the sun into a black hole, you would have to take the sun and squeeze it down to, I think, the size of this room, roughly, I'm guessing. If you wanted to make the earth into a black hole, you'd have to squeeze it down to be the size of a peanut or a bean or a, a legume, you know, you know, some other small thing that's about that big. So take the entire earth, squeeze it down, boom, you'll have a black hole that big. You can turn you into a black hole. If I squeeze you down enough, all your atoms squish down to a high enough density till you are about the size of an atomic nucleus, you would become a little nucleus-sized black hole. So really, you can turn anything to, into a black hole, but there, the only way we know of in nature of making black holes is through gravity, because that's what gravity does, is to squeeze stuff and pull stuff in. And that only happens in the cores of the most massive stars, where you get the right conditions to create a black hole. Uh, microphone. Is it, is it possible to travel from one side of the universe to the other through a wormhole? Oh boy, wormholes. Oh, don't get me started. Well, too late, you got me started about wormholes. Um, so wormholes, I mean, this appears in like science fiction all the time. Right, is like, oh man, it's really hard to get from one star to another, just like I talked about. I know, let's make a wormhole and we can just go through that wormhole and then magically we're on the other side. So wormholes are a valid solution to the equations of general relativity, right? You can construct a wormhole if, here's the big if that no one really tells you about, you can construct wormholes if they are made out of something with negative mass. I don't know, that, that's the answer that comes out of the math. This is actually a pretty typical undergraduate college uh, homework problem in general relativity is how do you make a wormhole and you get something with negative mass. I don't know what that is. Nobody knows what that is. If you were to obtain such a thing, yes, you could construct a wormhole, but I don't see anything with negative mass kind of running around. Do you? Have you noticed any? No, not really. So there you go. So as far as I'm concerned, wormholes are a nice bedtime story. There's, a, yep. Is it true that, um, I heard that uh, galaxies take on this energy and uh, like you shoot a big beam of light and then 
Yeah, so I actually, I, I mentioned that a little bit. I'll talk about it a little bit more now. These are the things called quasars. Quasars are powered by supermassive black holes. And by supermassive, I mean at least a million times, usually a billion times more massive than our sun. Sitting in the heart of every galaxy is a gigantic black hole. Our own galaxy has one. Our own galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its core. And sometimes these black holes are hungry. They feed. They're active. Gas from the galaxy will fall into the black hole, swirl around it, and through some complicated physics, be, some of that material gets ejected before it reaches the event horizon of the black hole, gets ejected in long, thin jets that race all the way outside the edge of the galaxy. They inflate bubbles that are tens of thousands of light years across. These bubbles rise. Super complicated physics, really interesting physics. We see these quasars, again, from across the universe, these engines. And those black holes are consuming their own galaxy. They're eating it out from the inside. Also, another unpleasant place to visit in our universe. Okay, so this is going to sound stupid, but like... There are no stupid questions, just, just really stupid people. But there's... <laughs> no. All right, can you say it again? Uh, everyone was laughing at my bad joke. So UFOs, what does UFO stand for? Unidentified object. Right, unidentified flying object. If you see a UFO, if you see something flying that is an object that you cannot identify, it is a UFO. That is as far as you can go. To make the jump from, oh, that's a UFO, that's something I can't recognize. If you, to make the jump say, that's aliens, well, then you've identified it, haven't you? Can't do that. All right. If it's unidentified, it's unidentified. And if you know nothing else, if you have no other pieces of evidence, then you can choose. Either the government is lying to me and doing something in secret, or there's aliens. Okay, maybe you'll pick the aliens. Gosh. You're supposed to pick the government doing something, something secretive, something rockety, something space planey. So what do I think, especially the ones that lights off LA? So I used to live in California, uh, and there's Vandenberg Air Force Base, right in the heart of California. There'd be rockets launched all the time. They have test vehicles going on all the time. The government is a pretty busy thing, doing all sorts of secret stuff, testing out stuff. Some of it makes lights, some of it doesn't. I think it's totally benign. Well, maybe if you're on the... If you're on the wrong end of it, it may not be benign, but I don't think it's aliens, no. Time. <laughs> I, can, can you be my announcer for, for the 7 o'clock show? Yeah, can you introduce me? All right, yeah, yeah, time travel. So check this out. I can travel through time. There, I just did it. Did you see it? I, I traveled into the future. Isn't that amazing? You're doing it. Time travel. Time travel is easy. We all travel through time, just kind of in one direction. Going backwards in time, now that's a little bit tricky. And as far as we can tell, you cannot travel backwards in time. Not only do we have no physical way of doing that, but if you were to do it, it would cause all sorts of havoc. We have no, uh, you know, just it's a mess. Time travel's a mess. Uh, I do not recommend trying it. I don't think time travel into the past is possible. Uh, Stephen Hawking um, once famously said, if time travel into the past is possible, then where are all the tourists from the future, you know, trying to check out, like, the, the historical period of us right now? Kind of a good point. Do you believe in the existence of more than one universe? Uh, multiverse. Multiverse is kind of a tricky concept. Um, 
that one's kind of tricky. I mean, I hate to just say tricky when it comes to multiverses. There are lots of physical mechanisms, models of the early universe, that could generate what you might call parallel universes. But parallel is really the wrong word to use. Some of these ideas might be right. Some of them might not. And until these theories, until they can make testable predictions, until they can say, aha, if, the multi, if this model that includes things like a multiverse with parallel universes, you can test this model by looking at X, Y, and Z in your accelerator, in your lab, or by looking at this feature in the universe. If they can't give me a reason to believe in them scientifically with evidence, then I can't as a scientist. There's still the possibility, but there's no reason to believe in it until you have the evidence for it. You said that um, Earth and Mars, do you know what approximately a year we might be Mars? Approximately one year. So uh, uh, NASA plans to have a crewed mission to Mars in the late 2030s. That's NASA, though. I mean, I don't know. I'll probably be dead by the time NASA gets someone to Mars. Uh, you might be dead by the time NASA gets someone wise. I mean, there's delays, there's bureaucracy. Actually, I'm joking. Uh, quite reasonably, quite reasonably, a crewed mission to Mars will happen in our lifetimes. It may not be NASA, it may be a private company, it may be SpaceX or Blue Origins or any of the other half dozen companies that are trying to send people to Mars. Or it might be NASA itself. But we've got a roadmap. We know there's a lot of challenges, but we know the technology that we need to develop to overcome those challenges. And if we put enough resources to it, we can do it. What would happen if every orbit in our solar system got reversed? If every orbit? Oh, like a reversed? Uh, if every single orbit, if every single planet, you know, they're going around in the solar system like this, and you turn it around, went the other way, uh, nothing. Nothing. We'd have to run our calendars backwards or something, but. We got most answers to all of our questions. So I was sitting here thinking, would we ever run out of things to learn or find out about in the universe? No, I certainly hope not. Otherwise, I'm out of a job, right? <laughs> My job security is that there's always new things to ask. And that's something cool about physics and cool about science. You learn something about the universe, and you learn something. You uncover some mystery. You solve some problem. You win some Nobel Prize. But it opens up a dozen new mysteries. It expands what you know, but then you realize what we do know is just some small subset of all the possible things to know. And it opens up more questions. And, and the joy, the fun, is in finding out all these new things as you go. As you solve a mystery, you get two more mysteries. You get to keep going. Okay, we have time for one more question. One more question. This better be a good one, because it's the last one. Uh, if something gets too close to a black hole, what exactly happens? What exactly happens if something gets too close to a black hole? So here's what happens. Yeah, I'll get to that. Don't, don't spoil it. So check this out. My feet and your feet are a little bit closer to the center of the earth than your head, right? By, by that much, OK? So your feet feel a slightly stronger gravitational pull from the earth than your head does, just because your feet are a little bit closer to the earth than your head. On earth, we don't really care. But if you're near a black hole, the differences in gravity are very, very strong. Because black holes are really strong gravitational objects. And so if you're falling towards a black hole, your feet are a little bit closer to that black hole than your head is, which means they get an extra gravitational tug that your head doesn't. And so you start to stretch out a little bit, a little bit, as you get closer, this difference in strength of gravity increases to the point where you're stretched out, you are ripped apart, you are drawn into a thin piece. And the word we use for this in physics, the word that appears in astrophysical journals 
in serious conference talks for this process is called spaghettification. Because you get stretched out like a thin piece of spaghetti. Don't go near black holes, kids. The more you know. Yeah.